The infantry has constant replacements, men killed, men wounded. And so Captain Baker's, instead of just letting the replacements be brought up to us, found an excuse. He would send two men to division headquarters. They'd be there overnight and then come back with the replacements. With a kind of understanding that somehow the other would find a way of bathing, of swiping winter clothes, or somehow or the other just working their little magic, shall we say. Well, the rear echelon won pistols. Army regulations said that weapons unwanted them. So division headquarters were generally about, I don't know, 15 or 20 kilometers back. So we got back there. And we stood out like a sore thrum. Let me try to get just Is that better? Yeah. We'll okay. see. <laughs> So at any rate, we were billed had been the French cavalry. The floor slanted, were hard brick, so the flow of horse urine, but hardly a to sleep on. I had to get on a couple of chow. Hot food and everything so burnt up. Then we got to the supply hut, and the fellow that I was with, his name was Vernon Long, he was leaning over the counter talking and arguing with. Winter underwear and socks since my combat jacket. And uh, we used to carry uh, hand grenades hanging on the lapels of our combat jackets. Anyway, in walked a, a little lieutenant fresh from the States. We used to call them. 90 day wonders. I think it was three months of training and they were officers. And in the front lines there was none of this snap heels click and all that and the other. The, this was serious and so we all knew each other on a, either a first name basis or hey you or something to that effect. This little guy came in, and Vernon Long, leaning on the counter, had a German pistol stuck in his back pocket. So this fellow, fresh with all the rules of, of what the Army had, calls out, Soldier! And I'm observing this from the semi-dark. And Long, who was the oldest man in the outfit, he was just under 30, I think, Looked down and said, what do you want, son? Or something to that effect. <laughs> well, you don't say this to an officer, at least in the States. Where did you get that pistol? If you'd get your ass up to the front lines, you'd know damn well where I got that pistol. <laughs> anyway, the guy turns around and comes back with a military policeman and in a high adolescent voice says, arrest that man. At which point I stood up, grabbed the grenade, and the, the supply sergeant says, watch out, he's got a grenade. Well, the MP and the officer nearly tore the building down trying to get out of the narrow doorway at once. And something kind of went in both longs 
conduct than mine. It ended up, I fired a few shots at the new lieutenant's feet, and he broke every speed record running toward the division headquarters and long chased the military policemen. Now, a division headquarters has trucks and everything, and there's an endless line of traffic, and in these little one main street little French villages or something, you can imagine. So the Army engineers had built a, a three or four seater outhouse right off on one side on the main drag, and they had a big sheet metal pan under it. There were a little set of steps up into it. And from what Long told me afterwards, apparently the military policeman got into the outhouse, Long rolled a grenade into the pan. <laughs> he said the floor collapsed, the whole building kind of collapsed, and out came guys with their pants around their ankles. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, Long got away. I also got away. Now, we had made up that if there was any kind of a problem, we would meet in a cherry orchard out, out of the town, right outside the town. So anyway, I was running, and I had a, a, a few military police kind of chasing me around. I got to a point where there was a stone fence, a stone wall, about five or six feet high, and I got over that. Now, France had legalized an institution. Call it professional love, if you will. In vulgar language, a whorehouse. At any rate, the army, in its good judgment, forbade soldiers for going there. Not for the morality aspect, but men with venereal disease were just as much a casualty as a man shot. And so that was, so anyway, I got over the wall and it was a yard probably about the size of this room and there were a few little tables and girls were entertaining. There are future customers there. And over the wall comes this guy with a half a week's beard on his face, a dented helmet, a sagging uniform that's been soaked in mud and dried a half a dozen times, and looking thoroughly fierce compared to all the spick and span types in the echelon. That was me. Now, there is absolutely nothing like the high, shrill voice of a screeching French woman. <laughs> and especially when there's a whole chorus of them and you can't understand the language and you're trying to shush them up, you know, and all. So that was open air. And I ran toward the front. There was a building. There was an arch. There was a large door there, sort of almost like a barn door, and on each side were rooms. Well, I ran toward that front door, having in mind to get out and go, and I heard English spoken on the other side, and I thought, oh, God. So I turned and I opened the door to one of the rooms, and I engaged, and I broke into the middle of a, shall we call it politely, a commercial engagement. <laughs> at any rate, I remember they both looked at me with staring eyes, and I shushed them, and I got under the bed. And I could And a moment later, the whole bed was lifted off all over me, and here was this big sergeant of military police, and he had a, a guy with him. And I still remember, come, little dewdrop. So I got up. Well, apparently he didn't know that they were searching for me. 
but he thought that I was looking for romance. <laughs> so he says, why don't you come around the front? We always favor frontline men. <laughs> well, I said, oh, yeah. So I managed to get away. I got to the cherry orchard. I whistled. Long came from behind some bushes. We decided that it was much too dangerous back here. We better go back to the front lines. <laughs> well, we got back to our unit about midnight, and we told Captain Beatrice all that happened. He roared with laughter. He thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard about. So that was my adventure with European commerce and the disruption of it. <laughs> now, on um, night, Ed was given the sign to be a forward observer. I find he uh, there was a, the last German initiative called Operation Northwind that took place at 11 p.m. that night. So, tell your then your experiences that night through January 2nd. Well, of, shall I call it the mechanics of a, an army facing another army, there is the front lines, and then they men to be for what they call forward observers, but in effect to see if German patrols are coming or if there's a movement of any troops that are kind of quietly coming to overwhelm the, and to give some before they themselves are either killed or captured. And I was one of these very lucky people. So, on New Year's Eve, the German offensive hit. My regiment was the area where the first of them came. I was the forward observer. Immediately before that, there was an intensive artillery bombardment of German artillery and our artillery. The area was heavily wooded, and I still remember whole trees sailing up in the air. And I was wounded by a very severe concussion that saved my life. A big evergreen tree fell right across the foxhole that I and another man were in. And I have a souvenir of that. And the hearing aids that I'm wearing and the effects of a severe concussion that I had from that that for five year up to five years after the war I couldn't get a driver's license because I would get blackouts so I could be in the middle of talking with you and fall in the dead paint and it would last about four or five minutes and then I would sort of come to, you know come to and uh, but at any rate, that's what happened. And when we came to, I must have been out for about 10 hours or so. We were behind the German lines. I couldn't hear anything. I didn't know if they had gone so far that they would be or if they So I climbed the a little hilltop right nearby to see if I could hear anything and also if there were any dead to get ammunition or anything off them. And a German soldier coming along the footpath at the base of the hill saw me and took a shot at me. I pretended that I was hit and I kind of rolled down the hill and kind of struggled, but I got down to out of his sight up behind the dropped tree, and I was armed with a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle, which is like a light machine gun, you might say. You could put it on 
single shot or you could fire a full automatic. And I had the thing and, and the branches and all the thing. I got behind it. Well, the German got on, was flat on on the ground, and he raised his head up and part of his torso, and that was the last conscious movement the man made. I terminated his life. Now, one of the things is, frontline infantrymen can hear the sound of an explosion and know whether it's an enemy weapon or whether it's one of our weapons. And people that have survived long enough don't just blindly go bang, 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 bang all over the place. So anyway, we sat there waiting, wondering if a German patrol might have heard my shot. Well, nothing came, so I told the fellow with, I said, we'd better get the hell out of here, because they're going to discover him, and they're going to get us, and we're not going to be prisoners. So we were just getting ready to move when along the path came a, it must have been a fairly high German officer, because they wore gray leather short coats and he had a, a string of about a half a dozen men all holding five paces apart following him. Well he came upon the body of this guy that I had just gotten shortly before and he was still steaming. It was very cold weather. It was 20 below zero on the on the Seventh Army front, there it was the coldest winter that Europe had ever had. Uh, that, I won't say ever, but that, that Europe has had in 70 years, I think they said. And he stopped, and the others kept on coming until it was a dense bunch, and I could not resist it. I emptied two magazines into them, and then I knew because of the automatic fire that that was going to be heard and patrols were going to be there damn quick. So we got out of there and I wanted to put distance between us. And so we were dodging German patrols just almost all day. And I finally, the snow was hip deep and uh, we came to a little opening in the forest and instead of going through the woods and around, I decided to just cut across the opening. And I was about in the middle of the opening when I hear halt. And I looked and there was a three-man German patrol. And the sergeant in charge had his pistol pointed at me. The other two men had their rifles. And that was the end of my adventurous life. So, now in Alsace they speak German. And uh, so I had picked up uh, a little bit of German words. What? Now, we North Americans, the Australians and New Zealanders, are better fiscal specimens than the average European whether it's diet or what, I don't know, because all of us are descended from anything. But I must have looked formidable now. And so I said in German, you know, Krieg über für mich, war over for me. And they kind of relaxed because I looked formidable, and if I would have made the slightest wrong gesture, bingo, I would have been a dead man in a hurry. So as I came up, they all relaxed. Oh, sprechen Sie Deutsch? Oh, do you speak German? Uh, I am bisschen, uh, a little bit. And we, so everything was kind of relaxed. Well, they brought me to another group that had a officer in charge 
And then he brought me to a collecting point where the major officer in charge of that whole section was. And he was sitting in an American ambulance of that big red cross painted on the roof. Well, they must have discovered that body because it was, what was it, I think a day or two after I had shot the whole bunch. They wanted to know what I was armed with. And I told them I was armed with a little carbine. And I said that I had just come up as a replacement. And I was with a machine gun group. and. Uh, uh, I had, I was asleep in a shallow uh, sort of a trench and they were supposed to call me. And when I came to, everyone was gone. And so I heard some German soldiers and all around, huh, the American army, oh, the American army. <laughs> and I knew I was safe. <laughs> They had us all labeled as a bunch of ignorant, ineffective slobs with the, the fact that we were on the German border and that beating the hell out of them all the way across France didn't matter. But when I heard that, oh, I just relaxed. So I acted the ignorant slob. I did survive. They marched me and a few others that they had picked up into the Maginot Line. The area was around a major Maginot fortress called Bitch. And my division was appropriately called the Sons of Bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and from there began, uh, I was in the Maginot Line for, I don't know, about a week or so. Then they gathered a big enough bunch and they marched us into the Rhineland. Because we were, that whole area is just on the French side of the Rhine. And we marched and they brought us to a collecting area. And I remember they put us into the room of a schoolhouse. It was bitterly, bitterly cold. We'd had nothing to eat for about three or four days. And they took a few of us into the forest there to gather up some dead wood so we could put it into and light a fire in a little stove. And I rolled under the branches of an evergreen. That was my first escape attempt. And the next day some children discovered me I had taken off in a direction which I thought was Switzerland. I didn't realize that Switzerland was about 90 miles away, but whatever. Anyway, I was in a coma, and these kids called their parents, and these peasants brought me to their home, and then they called the military. So I didn't tell them I was trying to escape. I said I had gotten lost in the woods. So after that, they then put us in a railway car. They had these, what is it, 90 and 8s, they called them, 8 horses. No, 40 and 8s. Yeah, 8 horses or 40 men. They put 99 men into that. We were jammed like a subway rush in New York City. No water, no food. I think it was 9 days uh, or like that. Men died, for the bodies couldn't fall to the floor. I was lucky, I was up against one of the walls, and the railway cars in Europe, or at least in Germany at that time, had horizontal boards, and there was space between them, and I could scrape snow with my finger and have it so I had water. Food you can do without, water you can't do without. And then finally they they moved us, and after another day or so, we got to Stalag 5A near Stuttgart. And I was there for a short while, and then they moved me on to Stalag 4B. What else?
So uh, he was in two prisoner of war camps and then was liberated by the, the Russians. And um, uh, he and his, he made another friend uh, there, a uh, fellow named uh, Jack, and uh, uh, Ed, tell them about uh, your experiences with uh, stealing chickens, which he did to help provide for two women and two uh, children who were German refugees. And even though he hated Germans, he, he, uh, he did this to help them and also to gain some protein himself because he got from 165 <laughs> pounds down to around 100 pounds. And, uh, uh, they had uh, one one time where there was an incident that then led to an interesting uh, little trial that the uh, Russian commandant held. Oh, well, there's a lot of things leading into each other, but uh, I had made a, my second escape, and after several days I was caught again and brought back, and put into the prison within the prison called the Forlogger. And uh, we had a secret radio, the British had a secret radio in camp, and even the German guards used to ask where the front was and what the situation was. They desperately tried to find it, but it used to be broken into components and different men carried it, and periodically they would get together secretly, get the report, tell a few trusted men, and then they would visit the different huts that the English-speaking prisoners were in and give us a report on what the situation was. The German soldiers knew that they were getting falsified information. But at any rate, the Russians had reached the Polish border were an area called the Perpet Marshes, and Poland was all flat country, excellent tank country. And the Russians were winning like mad, and the Germans were retreating, and they were stealing our Red Cross packages, and we were starving there. So, I'm just wondering where to continue what. Oh, at any rate, eventually the we had word one one day we were all confined to the huts, and a German said if even a door was open, we stuck a head out, a person would be shot on sight. And at that time, they then pulled out and abandoned the camp. And hours later, Russian cavalry were there. And uh, the first cavalry were Mongols. We always think, you know, the Russians are all one nationality or one language. No, that isn't the case at all. They're mostly Slavic, mostly Russians. They had divisions among them, like Ukrainians and others. But they also had men from the Caucasus Mountains. They also had men from Central Asia. Yes, that's that cool. Sorry. Elderly Victor wants to join us here. One more seat here. And uh, I remember the three. They looked like American Indians. and submachine gun and in groups of three and the horses they rode were like horses I never saw before. They were in size for a horse and they had fur. They they had winter fur and it was kind of drooping off them and uh, I remember the impression was that it was a uh, a horizontal bar barrel with four thin legs, <laughs> sort of. But apparently, at any rate, they were reconnaissance. And then the Russian troops were men from the Caucasus, the first one. 
they had kind of yellowish complexion and they just looked different. They had different kind of cast of features than the average Slavic uh, major Russians. And uh, I had been let out of the forelogger, I think it was the day before the Russians came. And uh, when the Russians came, of course, the gate was thrown open and after a bit, oh, we had an inkling that something was going to happen. The Russian prisoners, there were different sort of levels of, of treatment. The English-speaking prisoners were all put together. So British, Australians, South Africans, New Zealanders, Canadians, Americans. And we were the best treated of all. And then you had different national groups. But the worst treated and treated like animals were the Russians. They died like flies. They were treated like no human being I could ever imagine would be treated. And the British remarked the night before we were freed, the Russians were singing. They had never heard that before. And some of the British prisoners had been taken to North Africa, so they were prisoners for a couple of years. And they said, here the Russian prisoners were singing. And all well, that was really something. At any rate, this fellow Jack that I had met there was an immigrant from Lithuania who was an American citizen, became an American citizen, was drafted into the army. And he wanted to get to Lithuania to see if his mother was alive, asked me to accompany him. Now he spoke German, Polish, Russian, and all, he was multilingual. And so, after doing a certain amount of looting around the place, we'd get into German farms and all, and see big empty boxes of American and British Red Cross. Felt like killing the bastards, you know. But in fact, I remember one almost humorous thing. We got into the basement of a house in a little village. There were no men, but there were women all over the place. And there were hundreds of bottles of French, either wine or champagne. It was like a gold foil around the, the neck, sitting horizontally, you know, in shelves. And we remarked why these dirty so-and-sos, they even stole all the wine out of France. So we wanted to take a taste of it, so I took a bottle and Jack took a bottle and I knocked the head off it and I knew enough German at that time to know they were all, women were all screeching, schwein, schwein, well schwein is pig. And I thought, well, they're calling us pigs, what the hell. So I took a swig of it and oh dear God. I am proof against hog cholera, I guess, for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, they were yelling, Schwein Medizin. I didn't hear the Medizin part, but I heard the <laughs> <laughs> So, at any rate, had a little bit of time there like that. Anyway, the Russians find
been a large battle in that immediate area that he no chance of it surviving. And the chance of his mother surviving would have been very strong. Plus the fact that in the best of health, I weighed 45 pounds, and he was was the same. So we came back, and they marched us into Risa, and we stayed in the what had been the German army barracks, and had the freedom of the town, and. Uh, while we were gone and trying to reach Lithuania, oh, uh, I'm getting it confused. First was uh, we we left and got into Poland, and then came back, and we found that all of the English-speaking prisoners that they had brought into Risa had been taken out and brought over the Elbe River and put where the Americans would get them. So we came back to Risa, and there were no other. American prisoners. At any rate, there was a situation. There were two German women with their very small children, and they were what Germans called flicklings. Who had, they came from East Prussia, and the Germans weren't very nice to their own refugees. And we did notice this one woman begging at the door. And the man put his foot against our chest and just kicked her and she fell backwards. Well, I come from a society in the United States where we do not beat women. We certainly don't kick women or anything. And I was absolutely horrified to see that. So I went up to the door and I banged on it. He opened the door and I grabbed him. I pulled him out and told him in my broken German that he had to get out of Ireland. And he did get out. And so there was a whole big apartment furnished and everything. So we put these women and their two little children in there. And we came too. It was a great big thing. I had a nice place to sleep on. Jack had a whole big room with a big other. And with his being able to speak Russian, and I began to learn German awful fast. I mean, initially you start all we needed for the black market in the camp was just up, down, yes, no, when, how much, what not. And gradually you kind of learn. Nate friends. So, now they had a curfew, I think it was about five o'clock, and no civilian could be out. proud to say that I was probably the most accomplished chicken and rabbit thief in Europe. <laughs> oh. And then chicken that I could find used to raise rats too. People did in their yards. They had these little hutches. There was a little park across the street from where the building with this apartment that we stayed in. Can hold out German in the house right there. 
and we decided that that chicken had a better future in the kitchen of the apartment we were in than it did just scratching around. So one evening we went over and in the park there was a Russian Signal Corps unit and Jack had made very good friends with them because he could speak Russian. And I remember that we got in, the chickens were in this uh, little out, it looked like an outhouse. And I took the pins out of the hinges, opened the door, there was a big padlock on the thing. But we removed the pins from the hinges, opened the door, took the chicken on the necks, and carefully put the door back and put the pins back in. <laughs> The dog came out and snarled at us, and I took a branch that was lying there and whacked him on the nose, and he slunk back into his little doghouse. And as we came out, I carefully brushed any of the dust or what so shoe marks wouldn't show, and we brought the chickens over, and the ladies were very happy. They were plucking and gutting chickens. and. We had chicken soup that night, I think, or whatnot. Anyway, a uproar was made. The German man, you know, uh, blamed the Russian Signal Corps unit for stealing his chickens. <laughs> so we, Jack and I were invited to the hearing. Mm -hmm. The officer knew, of course, everything about it. But we came, and he was very formal about it. He had the man state his case and all, and then, hmm, and he was the judge. And then he asked the Signal Corps men, and no, they hadn't taken it. Hmm, and he pondered there a bit, and Jack was translating for me. And uh, now, what about the dog? What kind of dog is it? No, is it a German dog? Yeah, the Deutsche Hund, you know, very proudly. He pondered, and then the light, ah, he said, I know what happened. The dog did it, at which, <laughs> at, at which the whole place broke into an uproar. The man that made the complaint in the country, he didn't much like humor, I guess. <laughs> that was what about that episode? <laughs> yeah, and uh, let me just I visited Scotland. I had an experience after we came, when the Russians put the railway through to Berlin, and uh, we heard that American troops were in Berlin. We knew it was time to go there, so we came. It was an interesting experience getting there. It took us two days by rail and went in peacetime as a couple of hours. But we got there, and uh, an American patrol recognized us because we were wearing American combat jackets. So I back, I said, let's be Polacks now. All these 
fellows came up. They barked at us in English and what, and we looked and, and answered with a few words of Russian and Polish, and we had picked up them. When the enlisted men turned to the officer and says, Oh, hell, sir, well, they're Polacks, they're not. So they let us alone. And we spent about two weeks posing as Polish DPs, DP meaning displaced persons. The expression kind of taking Berlin. It was a very interesting historical time, and uh, we taken and we're still there, being able to speak to them and a Russian regimental commander who could speak German, and I could speak German very well at that time, explained a lot of the tactics they used and the political purpose. They had enough artillery, they could have reduced Berlin down to man. But the Germans had instilled this kind of propaganda all three times as brave and twice as intelligent as anyone else. Sort of just wanted to be that. And so they decided that they would take Berlin in hand to hand conflict with whatever the casualties would be for the historic the game that was going to be played after. And we went through the whole course of battle with these men that had actually fought in it. And it was, as well as meeting men from different areas of Russia and determining what First World War, 5% illiterate. They couldn't read or write. My experience is that I met, they were 100% literate. So that never Modern have illiterate soldiers. You have to be able to read and write. There are directions, there are messages to be given and taken and whatnot. You can't have a mob of illiterate peasantry from, from the Middle Ages fight a modern war. So it was significant, you know, that this difference. I talked to men who wanted to know what their occupation was. Now the Russia war had almost no industry. Up a lot of heavy industry. So Russia had tanks and the Russian tanks incidentally were the best tanks to come out of World War Two. I looked at as as a tool and die maker and an engineering student, I recognized the workmanship, the sophistication of design and whatnot on our our artillery and weapons and whatnot. Uh, Russia had industrial and a lot of this later was of great value because after we did turn ourselves in, they flew us down to Paris to intelligence headquarters, and that was pretty intensive in interrogation. As in level officers, colonels, of men down on the actual soldier level to get the impression what the competence, sophistication, and whatnot of the average Russian soldier. So in the interrogation, of me, I was part of that interrogation. And of course, I learned a lot. But uh, finally in Paris, I was almost killed. They, uh, the Paris, they were shipping combat troops 
back to the States, or they were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. And so there were fresh troops that came over. This is pretty much the capital of Europe, you might say. And I think that every pimp and prostitute in Europe was quartered in Paris at the time. And it was chock full of American soldiers who, as the British put it, were overpaid, over here, and oversexed. <laughs> well, where I was billeted, or the administration end of the army, told me that there wasn't a day that there wasn't at least a half a dozen naked dead bodies of American soldiers that they would find. They used to be killed for their pants or shoes and the contents of their pockets. Imagine our pay was remarkable compared to European armies. Money didn't mean anything for coming fresh from the States and the PXs and watches. They all had fountain pens of the pockets that Europeans would only dream of, you know, and all. So, at any rate, I was down in the medieval area of Paris, down in the wee hours of the morning one day, and I sensed I was being followed. I used to carry a little German pistol in the shoulder holster. I looked over my shoulder and I saw these two North Africans following me. And I thought, oh, oh. I lengthened my stride, they lengthened their stride, and they were walking in, 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 in the same kind of pattern of steps that I was. So I broke into a run and they broke into a run. There was nothing hidden anymore. And I came up against a, a stone wall of some sort and I whirled around and I had my hand in to get the pistol out and this one came at me with a knife and I managed to get him on the chest and kick him back by then I had the gun out and he yelled something in Arabic and they both turned and ran well I could have shot them both but at that time Europeans were beginning to resent Americans and I could just imagine in the French paper Wealthy American kills two innocent workmen or something. To, I mean, there was stuff like that, you know, was getting... And of course, these innocent farm boys coming over with good pay, good shoes, good uniforms and all that. <laughs> anyway, the sprinkle through, through Paris, there were a little place there, a little red neon signs, hotel. Actually, it was, pla it, was, it was places that the prostitutes used to bring their, uh, their customers to. So I, get, I sort of ran my back against walls with a gun in my hand till I came to one of them. The room was the size of a closet. It had a co I, I ran thing. He wanted to know if I wanted a lady friend. No, I didn't. And I sat on the edge of the bed until daylight. Then I came to where I was billeted and I did a little thinking. I said, you made the campaign all the way across France. You were a prisoner of war. You made two escapes and they caught you again. You spent three months with the Ruskies. Get the hell out of here. You've had enough. And damn it, you've had your warning. <laughs> so I managed to get a pass to Le Havre, took the ferry boat across to England. I had an aunt and uncle in England. My aunt wrote a letter to my father, which I still have. Edward showed up. He looked so wan. He looks a little older. <laughs> I think I spent a couple of weeks of just bathing and sleeping. Wasn't that I was dirty, but just 
foxholes, freight cars, everything. I felt as if I was soaked in mud. I would fill a bathtub and sit in it for hours, and as the water got cold, I would just add hot water. Then I would go back to bed and just spend time, and I think I did that for a couple of weeks. And then I began to feel refreshed. I went into London several times, and then I, I decided that I would run up to Scotland. Now the Canadian Army was there, and the Canadian Army were all volunteers. So in the way that all the Irish came up and her in her, all the Scots came to Canada and then went inland to central Canada and all. So these fellows were lumberjacks from British Columbia. Pushed to be in Italy. And it's an overnight trip from London to Glasgow, and so we were doing soldier talk, armament, tactics, quality of officers, whatnot, equipment and everything. Now there's a custom in the British Army, it's an old-time custom, that when there's a weak uh, unit of some kind, uh, their morale isn't too high and their spine isn't too stiff. You put a unit of Scots, Welsh, or English in with them. To well, the custom sort of was in all of the Dominion armies, and so these Canadians were the stiffening of the spine that they put in with this Polish division, or so they said, you know. Well, I asked them, well, what sort of soldiers were these Poles? I remember this one guy with a long face, smoking a pipe, sober looking fellow, took the pipe, he says, the finest bunch, and I thought I'm going to hear some real praise of rapists and robbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we better stop here because, uh, as some of you have other time commitments, uh, we're available to stick around for uh, other questions, those of you who'd like to talk to Ed. Uh, again, if you're interested in the book, For Liberty, we'll be uh, happy to uh, sign that for you. And uh, thank you so much. For